Green screen. I think I'm going to fix the lighting, though. Just kind of comes off funny sometimes, you know what I mean? Um, well, you got to get the lighting out in front of you. Yeah, you know, I do. They're right here. Just kind of comes off funny sometimes. You know what I mean? There you go. That's what I was waiting for. Ah, cool. All right, there we go. SEO this week, everyone. Welcome to episode 117. My name is Clint Butler, in case you didn't know. And that cute, handsome fellow right there is Ted Kibitis, the genius behind Cora and pretty much all the SEO crap that I know. So, <laughs> hey, Ted, how you doing? Doing good. Awesome. This week, we only have four stories. Uh, if you don't know, and I went and I talked with Kyle. We were at the SEO Spring Training in Tempe, Arizona. Uh, that was a great weekend. Met a lot of people. I got a crap ton out of that uh, conference as well. Um, you know, talking to Marty uh, Marion. He's got on um, positioning. That he did a talk on positioning that was spectacular. Uh, that was probably the highlight for me. Uh, but with that being said, I didn't get to read a whole lot of news, just the 134 articles. So not, you know, not a horrible bunch like my normal 200-ish. Uh, but the uh, community is kind of slacking, and we only wrote about four things. And Google was one of them that wrote about stuff, so which made it pretty odd. So with that being said, I am going to switch to screens here. And I also said that I was going to talk about spinning this week. Uh, I know a lot of people want to know about my process and how to do that, so I got that all set up uh, as well. So we'll do the news first, then we'll do the spinning stuff, uh, and then we'll have you on your way. And so here we go. First story is from Search Engine Land. Is the, uh, the SEO advantages of machine-readable HTML semantic markup. So HTML5 is pretty much the new standard these days, uh, but a lot of things, obviously, WordPress, themes, and et cetera, sometimes they're not always kicked in. Uh, and I thought this was an interesting look at how to use some of the elements of HTML5 to tell the, uh, the browser uh, the you know what's going on with your site, and you can set up the hierarchy. If you haven't followed Kyle Roof and his training before or you know some of the stuff that I talk about, Hierarchy is actually pretty important when you're building out your sites, H1, H2s, all that stuff uh, in a system. And here is a code representation of why you should really be doing that. Uh, and it's kind of reinforced using the semantic SEO outline. So H1, H2s, H3s, all in their specific hierarchies uh, within your content. So I would give this a, a read over. Uh, maybe you can't, or maybe you can implement it on your websites. My theme on uh, Digital Ear is already implementing the article class. Uh, so what he talks about in the article, using readers to minimize your content, uh, that's already implemented in my theme, so you can check that out. Probably use Firefox as the best option. Uh, but you can see how this H1, H2, and H3, and how that importance plays out for you. I think that's a big question, Ted. I get that a lot. Is it okay to have an H2 on top of an H1, for example? Do you Are you feeling that a lot? Well, technically, there's nothing in the HTML specification that, that controls the nesting order of tags. So technically, like in this example that's highlighted on the screen, there's a header within an article, which I assume means it's the header of the article. But you could also have a header outside the article tag, and that could be the header of the page. And so technically, you can arbitrarily nest uh, most HTML tags. You can have divs inside of paragraphs that are inside of headings that are inside of nav tags, and that's all valid HTML. So the question is, is if there is this uh, semantic order and the order is important, who is defining what the official order should be? That's true. See, look at that. Uh, brain dumped. Let me throw one back at you. If it's if it's by code, you're allowed to do it. Why can't you wrap your logo in an H1 tag? 
you you can. <laughs> yeah, it works. <laughs> Browsers will render that. Yeah. And uh, not only that, you can do some crazy stuff. You know, being uh, in a software company that uh, writes web harvesting technology, there's a lot of weird stuff you can come across. Yeah. And one of the weird things that's only popped up in like the past, oh, I'd say three years, is all of the dynamic classes being applied to the body tag. I've found web pages that have, you know, a megabyte of dynamic classes thrown on the body tag. And people are like, Ted, why does this break your software? It's like, well, we didn't in imagine there being 25,000 class names on a body tag. And so we had to create features that could allow for these weird extremes in HTML that according to the specification, totally valid HTML. You could have a single HTML tag, like a body tag, be 25 megabytes and still be valid HTML. So while valuable from a technical perspective or allowed or acceptable during a, from a technical perspective, from an SEO ranking perspective, would, would you recommend doing that or would you try to keep it like Ted and I or Kyle and I teach in this format, the H1, H2 in a structure so that Google knows what the page is about? Well, I, I believe in the uh, keep it simple, stupid. If you have a 25 megabyte body open tag, uh, it's probably going to break in most tools out there. It might even break in Google. So you, you probably want to think about what you're doing. And, you know, odds are if you're making Google's life harder, they're probably going to like you less. Yeah. So if you're doing things that make Google's job easier, they're probably going to like you more. You're probably going to have fewer problems. Good point. Good point. Cool. Yeah, I might, you know, my site, some of them are H2s are on top of H1. Sometimes I don't even have a H1. So... I'm, I'm sure I could do a lot better job, but if the page ranks, then I just stop making improvements to it. So we'll see how that goes. This is an inherent, again, this is, you know, it's just a conversation piece, but it creates a good conversation uh, and a good testing idea too. So, yeah, I really like these tags. I like the idea of wrap your article in an article tag. You know, I, I think that's a great way to organize it, makes the code more readable for sure. Yeah, what's really cool, the reader function too, I've never used it in Firefox, but it actually shows up pretty cool. It's like a little AMP version of your website. So um, I thought that was interesting as well. And I'm down here on the rest, I was scrolling around, but he's got the rest of them for the footers, the headers, the nav, et cetera. So uh, that's pretty interesting. All right, next one. Google announced they had a bug where they were selecting unrelated canonical URLs and it was causing indexing issues. They actually announced this in Twitter from the Google Webmasters account. So if you see some weird stuff going on with that on your websites, just be aware that Google is aware and they're going to fix it. And as of today, I looked and I didn't see anything saying that it was fixed. Uh, but... Wait. Can you go to the top? I want to read that again. New bug. Possibly selecting uh, unrelated canonical URLs. And it can be impact the thumb breadcrumb trails on mobile. Interesting. And it might, in rare cases, it might prevent indexing. The, yeah, it might prevent proper indexing. Let's see. I don't know if it means unrelated within the same domain. Or like crazy under it, like picking different sites and related. Well, you got to be careful how deep in the weeds. Like this specific example seems like a very rare edge case. Yeah. But I would take the announcement of it to mean that they're still working out some of the smaller issues. And I honestly, I think we're gonna kind of with the indexing thing you discovered. Uh, the problems that I was having, the Search Console launch, now this, I think it all related to the Search Console. Uh, and until they hammer that beast out, they're gonna keep tinkering and messing with the main core of the, the algo. Uh, it might cause issues here. Also, they're bringing that new, uh, 
to bring in the Cora or the Chrome. I know how you use Cora, and it's got the old version of Chrome because Googlebot's using that. They're bringing that up to date. I'm still waiting on these on when it, when that's kicked off too. Well, Cora five has an updated embedded Chrome, so it, it's still not the latest version. It's like it's always a, a version or two behind, but it's updated from what it was. Yeah, what they were reporting was that it would actually there's going to match what users were getting from now on. Um, Oh well, that that would be great if they're publishing uh, uh, that Chrome source that quickly. Yeah, that would be awesome. <clears throat> All right, let's see. Use this strategy for your next web design. This is on Portent.com, written by Evan Hall. Uh, not a whole lot here. If you're not doing a web design or you don't do web designs on a regular basis, then you could probably skip of this. But I thought that it would create a really good checklist. So if there's a reader or a viewer. Uh, watching that wants to make a checklist and create some clickbank, I would go ahead and do that. They missed the mark here by not can, putting that into one. But. Can you scroll back? There was a list that had a, a thing that I always object to. Uh, keep scrolling. Ted always objects. Right there. <laughs> First bullet, redirecting old URLs to new URLs. Why the heck can't you do a website redesign where you don't muck with the URLs? You leave the URLs exactly the same so you don't mess up your rankings and your deployments for two months. In the first place. Yeah. yeah just, <laughs> just don't change the URL. You're welcome to change the design to your heart's content. You can change the content to your heart's content. Just leave the URLs the same. And then you don't have to map every URL you've ever invented or reinvented every two years for the entire history of the business going back. I mean, that, that one bullet right there is like 90% of the pain of, of doing a new website. Yeah, for sure. I don't know. You know, when we do web design, uh, sometimes my devs will change the URL and it just makes you want to dunk your pet your baby. So um, I'm right there with you. <laughs> You're like, you know, it's hard enough already to know uh, what the algo is going to think. And then you mess up one of the most important factors uh, for ranking, which is the URL. And it just baffles my mind sometimes. Other times, you know, you just can't avoid it. Like, like we have some e -com, an e -com client. His is on uh, you, Yahoo e-commerce. Where's your URL structure ever? Yeah, if it's third party, you're screwed. Yeah. But if you're doing custom development, you should be telling your design team, sure, you can redesign the website, but you absolutely cannot change the URL. Yeah. Not even by a single character. So work within those constraints if you have custom development. Right. Uh, and before Ted got triggered, what I was gonna say is if there's someone who wants to turn this into a nice checklist, uh, that would be awesome. I bet you, you get uh, it'll turn in some good clickbait for you. Uh, make a PDF checklist you can just hand out and, or give to your devs as they're going there and doing stuff. So this is a good article. Um, again, though, if you're not doing web designs, you can probably skip it. All right, here is the question for the week. This Google put out a survey on Twitter. Um, well, I don't know if they put it out on Twitter, but that was, it was found on Twitter and it's kind of spreading around the world via wildfire now because SEOs are freaking out. Uh, some of the questions in there kind of give you the impression that Google's going to start paying for features or, okay, charging for features. or want to charge for features. Yeah. <laughs> so here's what I've talked to. Let's see, Jordan Pierce. I'll quote him because he's he said this before, and then a bunch of other people are saying that Google won't charge for maps. But looking at the list of stuff that they're considering to charge here, uh, Google customer support, uh, get leads from competitor profiles, automated response for reviews, instant quotes. They're going to add a lot of paid. They're looking at adding a lot of paid options to this. So. I know, Ted, you don't do a whole lot of stuff to maps, but... Oh, well, I've I've been saying for over a year now that the, the best SEO exploits right now are in GMB local. Uh, the, you know, the SEOs that are saying, I'll get you to page one in an hour, they're all doing it through these mechanisms. Yeah. 
Well, some of them. <laughs> yeah, but I, it, I know the GMB, there's a lot of people making a lot of good money from it. Uh, and I figured the writing was on the wall when they started making people pay for the Maps API. Uh, it's public company, publicly traded, and these shareholders are going, look, we invested all this money in Google Maps. What are we getting out of it? Because right now there's, what, one ad spot inside of there? Uh, and then one of the local pack. It's more clever than that. They've got an entire industry of people who have built their businesses around these mechanisms. And now to keep those businesses open, they have no choice but to pay. Yeah, well, you know, I... I it's SEOs that are using it the most, uh, and they help promote it. They got the small business people on board. Then the community as a whole started leveraging using maps, uh, which sounds really familiar to the AdWords program and how that started. They launched AdWords. They got affiliates to use it. They got, they got them to use it well. They got local businesses hooked, and then they said, F you affiliates. And to me, this is the F you affiliates part for Google Maps. Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah. One thing that's scary to me is that get leads from competitor profiles. So if you have, to me, that reads, I have a business.google site. I'm on GMB. I'm not paying. And then Google is going to add advertisements for my competition on my business.gmb. That's how that reads to me. And, or they'll put them on your listings. I think there's some ads like related businesses on some listings already. They're probably tinkered around with that. That's probably something that we've seen here. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see how that goes. And or if you pay, you don't have to worry about your competition being listed on your listings that you're working to rank. So there's an interesting conversations for sure that are going to get started. Uh, again, everyone's saying, oh, they're not going to make you pay for maps, but I think you're going to end up paying for all the cool stuff that converts uh, pretty quickly here soon. Yeah, you know, Google's been cracking down on uh, a lot of the map and GMB exploitation, so there's a lot more manual review. Like, I, I did a GMB for... Uh, for one of my businesses and somebody narked on it right away. And the following day I got a call from Google, a human being at Google actually called me to say, Hey, is this legit or not? <laughs> and so all of that in my mind is cost like Google's paying out of pocket to do all that work. So there's little doubt in my mind that, you know, pay to play is coming. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think honestly, it's a good thing though. Let's think of it this way. If you're using GMB for lead gen uh, and you're making some good money, you pay $20 for a few things. You know, you get rid of all the excess ones that aren't making you any money anyway. Pay 20 bucks or whatever the fee ends up being uh, for some enhanced features to increase your CTR. It's going to pay for itself. Well, the, the place where it blows people up is it's hard to look like 500 different people if you're using the same credit card. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's that's the hassle that comes into the uh, Black Hat local community. Uh, unless you have a Walmart and you just go buy some prepaid credit cards. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I'm encouraging you guys to do that. But it's a huge <laughs> barrier to entry at that point. So yeah. they will deter most of that exploitation by yeah, charging. I think you're right. That's I guess it will we'll have to wait and see what they turn into paid options. So uh, I think it'd be pretty cool. Video in your business profile, that would be nice. I'm not sure that I would pay for that. But the rest of this is interesting, so we'll see how that goes out. Let's see. All right, any of the users out there, you guys have anything, uh, questions on that or the stuff that we've got for the news? Because otherwise, I'm going to move on to... So here's a, a couple of questions. We have... Uh... Uh, Alex asking, uh, do you make your H1 and meta title the same? And I, I try not to. In testing, I did find synergy between having your meta title and the name of your web page document. So uh, usecars.html. 
uh, that document name, having agreement between those did have some synergy effects. You know, I've read different uh, versions of that it matters or that, you know, that it can help or it hurts. I've never ran into an issue where I wanted to try different things. Maybe like a CTR when I'm playing with CTR, I'll try it. But typically my sites are set up wherever, whatever the title is, that's going to be the H1 or vice versa. Whatever I put in H1, like digital ear, whatever I put in H1 is going to be the title thing. So, Well, in, in modern browsers, you're typically unaware of the title because the tabs are too short. So yeah. you typically only see title in the search results. And H1, for all practical purposes, is the title of the page that the visitor sees. So I doubt that Google would punish it for that reason. Yeah, that's, that could be it. Or if you have different, you can use that as an opportunity to add more variations and stuff. Um, that would be a reason to have different ones. And yeah. So, but typically, I don't. I don't really worry about it. I usually keep them the same. Uh, like I said, the only ones I do is if I'm messing with CTR uh, in search, and then I might change the title, and I won't worry about the the H tags on the post itself. But I'll change the title tag. So Christopher wants to know, how do you get uh, page one in an hour in GMB? And uh, I say you talk to Jordan Pierce because I don't want to out his methods. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the easy way is to go find the rinky dink town there is that doesn't have anything in that market and build one. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's the easy way. Um, but yeah, Jordan's got some good ideas on, on ranking. He's using some different methods. I know he's got a software coming out. Uh, I talked to him this weekend, and it's, it's got some some issues going on with it. But uh, once that goes, I think it's pretty exciting that the system behind it, he kind of explained to me a little bit, is really smart. Uh, so I, I think it's a, if anything, you can leverage it and dump like things like local Viking or local Falcon. I think it was one he was looking to compete with. Uh, and, and leverage it in a much better way. Uh, but you do, I'll go ahead and drop this, is when you use this stuff, you're probably going to have to add that, knowing what you're doing, what he's doing after you get access to it, uh, is add that cost to your monthly service fees. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're going to be getting results for your clients anyway, so I think it'll be worth it. All right, let's see. We got anything else? Nope, that looks like it. Okay. Oh, have you filled out the GMB survey? Me? No, man. No, I'm. I you know OTT over the top SEO. We do a lot of maps, but I got staff that messes with all that. So the only thing that I deal with is ranking the maps themselves. And, um, yeah, I just Google's got enough people in the white hat world that'll give them all the information they want to hear. So I'll just save my opinions to myself and give them to you guys here. <laughs> All righty, so let's go over spinning. Ted, do you do spinning? I love spinning. Um, it's a lot of work, though. Oh yeah, <laughs> to do it to do it well, it's a lot of work, and that's that's where I hope AI can come in is uh, using AI to craft spin text well. Craft spin text well. Hopefully, I can figure that 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 out. Uh, I'm looking for a developer. I will say, here's a good one for you. I have a, I got core automation tool that's made, and I gave the package away to some devs uh, to price quote me. And one of them quoted me 40 hours to add probably what you wait to one line of code uh, to the software at $65 an hour. It would have been all great and wonderful, but I realized yesterday while I was tinkering around with the, my copy that I got from Ted, who wrote the stupid thing for me because he tired of, got tired of watching me flounder, is that Ted only gave me the installer package setup. So I didn't, the the people that were quoting me for work were didn't even have access to the code that I thought I was giving them. So that was kind of interesting. I got to see that today. Uh, I don't know why... Uh. Oops, I'm sorry. Anyway, so we're going to talk about spinning. In the interest of time, this is English Gibson. 
Ted probably recognize it because I use his tool to make the stupid thing. Uh, otherwise, this would be like a three-hour show, and I don't have the patience for that. So you're going to require you all use your imagination. Pretend this is a nice article that you had written or you wanted to write or whatever. But this article makes absolutely zero sense, as Dan Hale already uh, checked out. And my guess is he's going, see, spinning doesn't work. Well, that's true. If you're using gibberish, it doesn't work at all. <laughs> um, so what we do is I take our article and I break this down. It's already busted down into four paragraphs for structure. Uh, typically, that's what you're going to do anyway, right? And now you have to spin each one of these paragraphs. Uh, and that is going to end you up in this situation right here. So how do you spin it? What you do is you create four brand new paragraphs. Pretty simple, right? Four paragraphs, you can say the same thing if you want to, et cetera. The work comes when you get down in here where you're busting that paragraph down into sentences. Uh, typically, what I do, and for ease of doing this just to illustrate is I write three sentences for each one of those new paragraphs. So now I have one, two, three. So three sentences, one, two, three. So each one of these sentences now has three new sentences. All right, so you got that part. We're there, you all with me, hopefully. Next thing you do is actually spin inside of these sentences and I'm just going to put, again, I'm using gibberish for ease alongside. Ease. Yeah. That fingering. B side. B sides. Um, and I'm going to put one for dance until you already read it. Then. <laughs> all right so i go through and do that for all of those right and then you want to put your pipes in in and I want to put my closing spring bracket here and I'll put one here and because everything now is all spun yeah. somebody asked the question how do you feel about programs like word AI and a lot of the spinning packages out there are great but with limitations if you're manually crafting your spin tax, you tend to get perfect spins, but when you use their auto spin features, you tend to get kind of garbage spins. Yeah. And some of them have better auto spinning than others. So the degree of garbage changes, but they're all generally pretty bad for auto spinning. But for manually crafting and spinning, if you do it manually, you get perfect spins nearly every time. Correct. Uh, the SEO, I use um, Spin Rewriter when I'm just doing junk stuff, and I don't really care about whether it looks good or not. But if I really care, uh, then this is the, the method that I go through. Obviously, what I just did there was pretty damn fast, right? However, when you're actually doing this by yourself, there's some tips that just kind of make it easier, in, in my opinion. First off is break down your article just like I did here in the paragraphs. And then get yourself an account or get yourself a text voice to text uh, creator because it makes it going a lot faster and banging around unless you're really good at typing. Uh, it makes it easier to rewrite the paragraphs. Uh, and the same goes with the sentences. Once you rewrite your, your, um, your paragraphs, you're going to have to bust down all of them into the sentences like we had here originally. Uh, hopefully you remember that. And use your voice to text. Like I use Dragon Dictate, and I have a Logitech uh, over the ear uh, microphone set, and I just bang these out like that. 
Uh, then go and do your spinnings on the word. At the word level, inside of the sentences doc, just like I did here, are illustrated right here. So that when you mash all those back together, you're kind of working backwards. Um, typically, what I'll do is this document will get turned into one, two, three, four text documents that I'll have side by side. And I'll work in those text documents and slowly put it back together in, in a doc into a, another document, if that makes, hopefully that makes sense. So, uh, do you remember your, uh, your grammar classes in grade school? Uh, well, yeah, some of them. <laughs> yeah, I, I found that once I got into spinning, all of those, you know, grade school and junior high grammar classes all came flooding back, parts of speech and subject and predicate. And it turns out that every sentence that has a subject and predicate uh, phrase uh, can be inverted. So you can instantly double all your spins. And, and the example I like to use is Ted went to the store to buy some milk. You could instantly rewrite all of those sentences to buy some milk, Ted went to the store. Same meaning, you're just inverting, swapping places of the subject and predicate phrases. And that's that's a cool trick if if you know how to identify those. Oh yeah, for sure. Here's another one, uh, and this is my new favorite. Uh, Cloud.google.com. Actually, that's the wrong one. That's not the one I want to use. Google NLP. And I'm going to show this, and I know damn well there's people watching there and they're trying to send to you. Oh, I'm make a software that does that. Well, I've already got one coming. It's going to be better. So go ahead and knock yourselves out now. Uh, I'll be ready to smash you. <coughs> Common sense NCO. It's for you. <laughs> so, what do you want to do? Take your paragraphs that you already have and drop them in here. This should not work, I don't think, because I get the ipsum, so I shouldn't probably not see entities. Ah, we got one. Others. Uh, and what I do is I lock these entities in place. So uh, let's say I want to rank for Los Angeles SEO. I'll go in here and download the articles from all the, the competition, 10 or 20, depending on what I'm doing. Typically, just 10 is fine. Put them in a tool so I just have their content and find out all the entities. Uh, find the articles with the most entities or the paragraphs with the most entities, and that's how I create my base article. I'm going to make it, you know, Put them all in here, make sure it makes sense, lock the entities in place. Oh, wrong window. Uh, and then I will spin around these entities. Uh, and you can also do the same thing with variations from Quora. So I, if I'm trying to rank for Los Angeles SEO, I've already run the, the tool. Uh, Quora 5 Ted took mercy on me and is making it so I don't even have to run the tool. I just put the keyword and I'll pull those out. Uh, and then you just drop those inside of here uh, as well, and you can you know lock those in place. To remember, just if you just change the color, really is all I, I really do is I just change the color of the words that I don't want to spin, uh, and then you you just go to town following that. That is going to get you some natural language NLP stuff going on inside of there, uh, and make your make sure your content is a lot more relevant relevant uh, and then you can do some stuff with these other than that that is really cool in schema and but i'm going to save that one for later uh, and you can also go ahead oh i was going to say i think that tool does the parts of speech tagging it, it might even do the subject and predicate uh, mapping too if you look at the other tab they had on there yeah i think they do that and they also do sediment so i like using that sometimes with uh, titles to make sure that, to see what the sentiment is. And you can compare the titles from like the top 10, top 15 pages and see how much, if there's sentiment. And the most common word, like you determine, you saw best and you put that in Quora, but uh, you can use that for some other ones too and just kind of pinpoint, hopefully pinpoint some common things that go along with that. Let's see. All right. 
Let's go to questions. Ted, wouldn't that make the copy use a passive voice often, which is not ideal? <sighs> well, the, the thing to keep in mind is that normally you're spinning an article that people are going to take time to go through. But quite often what you're promoting, your ad, your call to action, is not actually in the article. It's actually something on the page that's far more prominent and eye-catching. So to that degree, you're trying to get unique content that's human readable. And you have your offer outside of that. You're not putting your offer in the spun content. Yeah. You know, honestly, if you're using spun content on a money site, maybe you mass generated a site um, and you're <clears throat> in the camp of duplicate content doesn't matter. So like in, in my mass generated bills, I'd use the same article on every one of the pages, <laughs> like literally the same article and just change the location identifiers or whatever uh, I'm going for. Um, but sometimes some people just don't want to do that and they don't trust that Google's going to uh, let them get away with it or they want to keep that site around longer. So mine, you know, if I'm doing it, I'm just going after, I'll do mass gen, throw it up, see what sticks and then use that information to do my keyword targeting for my real money set. Uh, yeah. If you're yeah. doing mass gen and you want to keep it, then this is the way to go for spinning. Yeah, and here's a potentially white hat-ish way to use spinning. So you invest a ton of time creating an awesome article. Why not spin it 15 different ways, see which one ranks best, and go with that, then retire the ones that don't rank best? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you've invested the time. Don't you want to go that one step forward and figure out the best incarnation for the organic rankings? That's true. Yeah, you can do that. That's a lot of work. <laughs> well, but if you're putting a, a week into writing a, a piece of content, what's the extra two, three days to get the optimal form? Yeah, good point, good point. I think the NLP stuff, that helps with that too. Um, either way, whatever you want to do to skin the cat. I also use this content on web twos, like Dan mentioned. Uh, it's pretty good. SEO autopilot is typically what I use uh, for the web two creations you know, when and if I'm doing them. Uh, and this kind of spun content works really well in there. Uh, I use it for cloud stacks, uh, especially if you're using a tool like uh, RYS. Uh, what is it? No, RFR, Rank Your Ranking Factory Revolution. Uh, and they have a built in cloud stacker in there. Uh, this is really good for that. Like you can put one in uh, for, you know, let's say you have a client, you know you're going to have to do a whole bunch of them. You take the time, you spend this one article, and now you can just let your VA go to town for like a couple months using that one same article and, and doing stacks upon stacks upon stacks if you want to. So the Ranking Factory Revolution is really good for that. Um, let's see. What else do I use spinning for? Bookmarks. I just like create a bookmark, probably about that big. Uh, and do you know like 10 20 different nice solid versions and then spin the hell out of that you can use those for bookmarking tools and kind of get a unique um, bookmarking set out of that here's here's an amazing couple of ideas for people who want to build businesses around basic spinning uh, one idea is create a wordpress plugin that will spin the summaries of the articles that you have. And that way, when you syndicate those RSS feeds out to all the different websites, what you get aren't exact copies of your content. You have the original content on your website, but you syndicate spun copies. Huh. And that way you get your backlinks without uh, destroying your unique content with RSS syndication. Another thing you could do is if you're a content creator, you should love spinning because what you could do is write in handcrafted spin text instead of just plain English. And then you could sell spun copies, perfect spun copies of your articles to other places without uh, infringing on the, orig on the original. 
So you could potentially be selling subscriptions to handcrafted spun articles to people. And you'd probably get more money than just your per word count because you could resell the same product so many times. Yeah. These are also good if you want to do, let's say you're doing a uh, guest post outreach. Uh, a lot of those guys and gals want um, unique stuff. So kind of building on what Ted said, you just spin that in this way. And now you have a unique one for every one of those authors and you only have to pimp one topic, yeah. uh, which is a lot e easier than pimping. Here's my article set. Do you want this? And, you know, most of the, honestly, I think a lot of people are ignoring those at this point. Like I, I know I ignore them uh, versus I have a much better result when I say, here's an article. Uh, I would like to, you know, a guest post opportunity on your site. It's already ready. It's already written. You're not asking about writing guidelines and all that madness, like pretending like and getting the impression that you never bothered to read their site in the first place. Uh, and you get more links that way. So this is a good way to do that. And these aren't plugins that exist. These are businesses that you can actually be first to market with and you could own the industry if you can get out there quickly with a solution for these kinds of things. So these are business ideas that, you know, if you're halfway decent at coding or you have a halfway decent coder, uh, you could probably bring these ideas to market pretty quickly. Yeah. If you leverage his idea on the RS RSS uh, summary spinning alone, there's so many communities out there that are already built around the concept of IFTT and or, and or teach it or use it. There's a, there's a built-in market for you right there. Uh, and that saves a lot of a lot of headaches for IFTT users, especially if they're of the lazy kind like me, where they're just sending in stuff from your website. Uh, now you can leverage what Ted said and, and get a good advantage out of it. So um, I challenge one of you to build that. How's that? I challenge you. Let's see, Dan Hill, Clint, so you do this for every campaign with SEO AP. It depends on where I'm pointing it. So if I'm pointing it at like my really good tier ones that I kind of want to save, then that is how, um, this is how I did. That's correct. Otherwise, I'll just use uh, SEO Spinwriter. Uh, Dwayne Armstrong shared Matt Woodward's video tutorial on spinning if mine uh, my, obviously, mine is a short version. I think Matt's video is like, what, two hours long, Dwayne? That is the one. When he published that, that's how I started spinning. Uh, and he published that a couple of years ago. Uh, and I said, as I said last week, uh, I challenge you guys to find Matt's video because that's really all I'm doing is just doing what Matt taught. So, yeah, one hour. Uh, and I think he's using the best spinner in that one. Uh, I use uh, Spinner Chief sometimes. Best spinner I had a license to uh, what else do I, but mostly it's just, you know, some text documents, just easy. Um, but those other ones that help, you know, if you're just vocabulary de in a deficient, uh, use the tools. Uh, they're there, just kind of make things a little bit cleaner for you. Yeah. In, in terms of advice on, on manually crafting, like you can get a 2x on your combinations by doing the subject predicate thing. Another thing is you can, uh, typically swap whole phrases so you don't have to do single words and once you get into that whole phrasing you get a, a lot more combinations i find yeah. and you need a you need a good uh editor because it can be hard to read and you typically have to go sentence by sentence uh so because otherwise it just gets too big it just gets too confusing and uh some uh, sin, uh, spin tax uh, software solutions will let you do nested spinning so you can spin even more spins internally and those help you get the number of combinations that you're hoping to get out of your spins yeah well that's why i break it down like i do like i'll, I'll put it on like i got 27 inch monitors so i'll literally have text file running across both monitors uh, and then i'll bust down the paragraph uh, and give each paragraph its own little file. Then I'll break it into the sentences, and then that's when I start doing sentence variations. And I do sentence variations before I do that nested spin inside of the sentence, uh, partly because of what you said. You can say the same thing in different ways. 
and it's easier for me and my little peanut brain to do it uh, in the sentence before I start thinking around with the, with the spinning yeah. the words themselves. Uh, and then I just put it all back together. And somebody just brought up uh, a Fiverr gig for doing manual spinning work. If if you're a content writer that is looking for easy customers, but you know harder work, I think you could be charging a premium. Like there was a point uh, last year that I was willing to pay any rate to get somebody to to manually craft uh, spin tax and nobody does it. Nobody offers it. And there's, you know, apparently this one guy on Fiverr, you can corner a market as a content writer uh, doing that. But again, you could also write an article in a popular uh, topic and just sell unique spins of it that pass copyscape, you know, and then you can resell your, your creation multiple times. And I think there are very valid business reasons, very white hat uses for using uh, spinning. And even though uh, a lot of the white hat SEOs just call it web spam and write it off, I don't think they've actually thought about it. Yeah. Well, I, let's see if, when you're talking about writers, I've known people where you, they charge like $50, 50 to $100 to do w this process. Uh, which is really fair for them, especially let's say you, you buy a 1,000 word article. Now I spin it. You see now you're doing it manually. You're breaking that down. So you're creating probably what? Four or five 1,000 word articles just to start getting the spin variations uh, before you start dinking around with the word. So I think 50 to to $100 would be a fair price uh, if you want to do a service like that. Yeah, yeah. And I... I think it would be an awesome change to the whole industry if I could go to a blog I like, if I could go to Digital Ear and say, hey, I really like this content, you know, for $100 a month, I want unique spins of every article you write just automatically posted to my WordPress blog. Yeah. Here's the publish email. Here's my credit card. Send me unique spins every time you write a piece of, so uh, of content. And that would be an amazing industry for content writers. Somebody at some point has to make that WordPress plugin. That's true. Uh, let's see, Ted, if you were gonna do that, what would you consider Copyscape good enough? Uh, well, good enough so that people don't complain and ask for their money back. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's a threshold thing. You wanna try to give people unique content. And so that's why it's, all the more important to craft your spin tax well. Yeah, I, you know, if you're gonna sell it like that, I'd do the Copyscape or the or Grammarly. I use Grammarly, uh, same concept, um, just to be uh, fair. And then as far as guest posting multiple spins, 80 plus, I send out typically when I'm doing guest posts like 200 emails. Uh, so if you can, if you spin it, get enough to get 200 unique versions, then there you go. I think you've, you've done it. But again, you know, it, it just depends. If you want to save it for later so you can do, let's say you're doing this for clients and you want to send 50 a month, 50 outreach emails a month, and maybe that secures you five to 10 uh, backlinks. Uh, so you do it, take a really good shot at this, do a really good job and just rinse and repeat and use that one. Hell, you could probably use a really good spun article uh, for a year doing guest post uh, outreach. So it's certainly worth a, uh, a look at. Uh, I think that's it. So my final thoughts on spinning, take your time with this uh, and, and make sure that if you're going to do it in this way, in the way that I just showed you, in the way that uh, Matt Woodward's video shows you, know that it is going to be a long process, two, two and a half hours, uh, easy. Uh, so don't do it for garbage, I won't say garbage because garbage is kind of a strong term, but don't do it for your general link building, do it for your good stuff. Um, and then uh, make sure that you get a software that'll help you actually read it. Uh, and if you're gonna use it for the outreach stuff, make sure that <laughs> after you spin it, you re review it again and clean it up just in case you miss something uh, in the uh, 
in the past, but that's really easy if you're using something like Google Docs and Grammarly, for instance, or um, or you just or the Grammarly's got one plugged in for WordPress now. Just pop those in there real quick. Make sure they're all grammars all cleaned up. Package it out. Throw it into your stuff and send it right off the bat. And Dwayne Armstrong's correct. You can use this stuff all on tier one, especially if you're manually spinning. Uh, if you're going to use the Spinner Chi for Spin Rewriter, Word AI, just know, um, you know, it's a machine doing it, and there's sometimes you're just going to mess it up. It might make the process a lot easier, um, but you're not going to get away with as much as you would if you just do it this way uh, and do it right the first time. Again, like I said to Dan for guest posting, how you use this one for a whole year. So two hours of work for a year articles for outreach. You can't beat that. So. Any final words on spinning, Ted? No, I, I like it. I think there's a whole potential industry that's untapped around spinning and, and selling content and subscribing to blogs content for a fee to get syndication on your WordPress that spun. Hey, you know, I, I, I just think there's so much opportunity. Somebody's going to make a fortune off of this. Yeah, I think so. If, honestly, you got to have the patience for it. it so that won't be this guy, but um, try it out. Uh, Andrews Franks, how's your setup for dictating text? Again, I use Dragon Dictate because I'm on a Mac, and then I have this is the, the headset I use. Uh, just because my blue is okay for dictation, it just kind of messes it up, or the dogs start barking or whatever, uh, and this one just filters it out. And this is the Logitech G330, uh, really good setup. So it, that works fine for for that. Um, if you're on Windows, drag and dictate is good. Yeah, you know, <laughs> the problem I have with a number of uh, current uh, spin tech solutions out there is the thesaurus they use. I find that the dictionaries that these tools use are usually the, the biggest problem because they'll go into synonyms that are old English or slang or they're too academic, they're too, uh, too high of a reading level, they go into the academic terms for things. And really what you need is like a blue collar web thesaurus. So this is the thesaurus of how people talk on the web, not all the academic crap, not the old English. Uh, so if you have any control over the thesaurus that's being used, try to dumb down the thesaurus and your spins will get much better. Good point. And Jordan Pierce is in chat, and this is a good one, so that's why I'm going to repeat it out loud. Is he said he's spinning manually his press releases, so he can use his press releases over and over again. Uh, I'm an idiot. I should have thought of that. So that's that's a, that's a great uh, use case, Jordan. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Common Sense SEO, those guys over there recommended Google Docs. They have tools, voice typing. So there you go. There's another option if you don't want to use Drag and Dictate. Uh, I, you know, again, that's a, it's an option. I use Drag and Dictate. I prefer it better. Um, but find out what works for you and just do it is at the end of the day what's going to be. Uh, shout out also to those Common Sense SEO guys. I dropped your guys' name over at SEO Spring Training, so hopefully you get some more views. Uh, it's because they're putting out some decent content, so check them out. I know they don't promote back to me. That's okay. Um, but, you know, it's good content, and you guys should enjoy it. Uh, let's see. Says Skylar Samuels, do you manually rewrite your content for SEO Pilot? Yeah, Skylar, I do, as long as I know. Uh, it depends on where I'm sending it, obviously. So if I'm going to use SEO AP direct to the money site, then I'll do this. Uh, and if I know I'm going to do it a lot, Let's say you know you're going to hit multiple pages in local, for example. Uh, I add the variation, just give myself a little token inside of there where I know I'm going to change the city, uh, and then I'll use this one manual spin over and over again. Um, and you can use the tool to figure out how much, how many articles you, you can pull out of that one manual spin doing that uh, to see how far you can you can take that. But yeah, just do this one time, Skyler, and then you got three months of content for SEO AP for that client already done uh, let's see 
Scholar has a unique tip. Download YouTube captions. Just edit to make them readable. Lots of quick content. Yep. Uh, we shared that one a long time ago. I've been using that for years. Uh, the captions or the transcripts. Uh, take that one step farther. You create an article out of it, then you manually spin it, uh, or you download the transcripts from 10 of them, mash it together, create a unique article. Uh, there you go. All right, I think that is it. All right, so that's SEO this week, episode 117. Next week, we're going to talk about, probably going to go over Anchor Text. Uh, Michael Milas created a good system. I taught this over at SEO Spring Training uh, as part of the uh, presentation that I wanted to share with you guys. We're going to go over how to look at your competitor's anchor text. And it's kind of the same way that Core is looking at all the on-page factors. You're going to do that with the anchor text. Explain that in detail. Uh, show you the system that I have currently that I'm doing it with. Uh, and I got a software uh, we're building out in order to take advantage of make it a little bit of a smoother process. Uh, so I hope you'll be here for that one. Ted, SEO Fight Club. Yep, uh, we've got a mystery on our hands, and if you're in the uh, Cora and Pop Skype group, you've seen uh, some tidbits of it, so we're going to discuss that mystery this week. So uh, it's, it's confusing, and it's the act of testing out this mystery and trying to figure out what's going on has led to some other insights, so we're going to go over those as well. Uh, but come prepared with uh, your general SEO questions. We'll probably have some time at the end to just answer, you know, general SEO stuff. Uh, but it's going to be a cool episode. So definitely check it out if you want to see some cutting edge SEO testing. Okay, and then one final note. I want to do site audit. So you guys know that I was on White Hat versus Black Hat with Josh. Uh, and the best part of that whole show for me was actually you guys coming in, bringing your sites and letting us look at them. Ted would run a core report. I would give my insights. Josh would give his insights. And we actually help people. Well, uh, I know craziness is going on here in the internet, but we want to help people. So bring your sites in. Uh, and, you know, it, we don't have to dominate with the news. If you guys are here, you're here early, you're waiting, and I have I show up and there's like five sites in there, then I'll just skim over the news and we'll do your sites. Uh, so, um, please do that in the meantime, hit share, hit save, hit the bell, hit the up thumb, hit the down thumb, whatever. Give me some engagement. That would be awesome. And thank you again for watching episode 117 of SEO this week.